Hello, and welcome to Leader Folk, an inclusive look inside the Jewish community. I'm your host, Sarah Bogomolny. Today, I'm so happy to welcome our guest, Rabbi Alyssa Cherney. She is the founder and CEO of Tackling Torah. She was ordained by the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College and strives to make life's ordinary moments into extraordinary ones. Tackling Torah exists as a way to connect with others and help people think differently about what role Judaism can play in their everyday lives. Rabbi Alyssa, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It's an honor to be here and connect with other Jews and talk about the future of Judaism. Absolutely. Oh, I also want to give a shout out to our um, our additional guest. Will you introduce him? Sure. So um, in the realm of parenting and working from home all at the same time in this COVID world we live in, um, my son, Zeke Joseph, is joining us. Um, he is eight and a half months old. Um, and a fun translation of his name, Ezekiel Joseph. So uh, Zeke means sort of strength and Joseph means to add Yosef. So he adds more strength to our family. So hopefully he does that today as well. Hopefully he joins his voice. <laughs> I'm, so, <laughs> I'm so glad he's here. He's the first male guest. <laughs> Wow. Now, that that is a good line for a podcast. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so fun. Well, thank you and thank you to Zeke for being here today. And um, I would love if you could just kind of give us an introduction to yourself. Where are you from? How did you come to be a rabbi? How did you come to be doing what you're doing now? I know it's a really big question. Feel free to start as far back as you'd like. <laughs> sure. Um, so I actually am one of those people that, for whatever reason, always knew I was going to be a rabbi. Um, I guess if you're highlighting female leadership, um, at my bat mitzvah, I had had these amazing women, um, Jewish educators, and I came home one day from synagogue. And I said to my parents, you know, I really want to be a Jewish educator and a principal of a school one day. And my father actually said, <laughs> yes, he actually said, you mean the rabbi. So um, I think in a lot of ways, he always was that driving force to say that, you know, as a woman, you could achieve just as much as um, any man. And it was interesting that I hadn't had any women rabbis in my own life, um, but have definitely been able to follow in their footsteps. And um, I'm grateful to all the women rabbis in my life who have paved the way and shown what it's like to be able to do so. Um, and so... So I actually went to Brandeis um, and Zeke, I'm trying to tell a story here. And um, on my first day of Brandeis, I met a conservative Jewish young woman who um, was shocked that I wanted to be a rabbi. And, um, and I think I took a lot of time during college to sort of figure out how the world of Judaism would react to um, a young female rabbi. And, you know, I'm still navigating that role. Um, whenever I show up in different spaces, sometimes people are just shocked that I'm the rabbi. But after I lead a service or a wedding or, or a funeral, um, I get responses that sort of, sort of say, wow, that was an amazing job and thank you for being here in this moment. And um, that's when I kind of go back and say like, yes, I was always meant to be doing this work and, um, and I'm so glad that I am. And how long have you been working on tackling Torah? 
So tackling Torah really started for me as a way to look at what our Torah says and add a social justice lens to it. Um, and it really started as a blog project that I just wanted to carve out some space in which every week I was looking at the Torah and seeing how it applied to my life and the people who I knew and, and their own lives, but it has evolved in many ways from that moment. Um, so that was in 2010, I believe. And, um, and since then I have taken it to mean Torah in the sense of living Torah. So there are multiple ways we can define Torah, but one of them is um, that our everyday lives are another way in which we live and breathe Torah. Um, so the way I currently think about tackling Torah is really just people who might feel like they're on the outskirts of Judaism being able to access it in whatever way is meaningful to them. So it's sort of like, okay, this is something that I too can be a part of and is not reserved for people that have a specific set of Jewish education um, or, um, or grasp of language or anything like that. It's that everyone Jewish or not Jewish and wanting to learn more about Judaism any of those pieces that Torah is really for everyone in their own way. What are some of your favorite ways to bring these people on the outskirts in? Um, so one of the main things I do is actually I'm with people in their life cycle moments. So life cycle is anything from birth, B'nai Mitzvah, wedding, um, conversion, any sort of big moment or small moment, um, and just being with people in those major moments has taught me so much about how to be present in our life. And um, so that's one of the things that I really help teach people is why are our rituals the way that they are? Where did they come from? Where is the tradition that they're based in? You know, why do we break glass at a wedding? Why do we um, have a chuppah above us at a wedding or make a, a sukkah in um, the festival of Sukkot? And really answer those questions for people in conversation or offering them resources um, and guiding them through that moment in their own life. And that's how I've met a lot of the people that I work with. Um, but then they sort of become people that are on the journey with me. And anytime they're looking to do something in their life, like they want to hang a mezuzah because they moved to a new home or they want to um, welcome a child or they just want to know more about Passover um, I try and just be there for them and help them with whatever they're looking to do. Yeah, that's so beautiful. I would love to hear from you, like, how does tackling Torah compare to a synagogue? Like, do you consider it to be a synagogue? I don't consider it to be a synagogue. And sometimes people will ask me, um, you know, they want to have a place to go for holidays or they want to, sometimes they'll ask me about questions that, where they want to have a physical space. And I really consider it more so that I'm bringing something to them or I don't have to be bound by a space or a location. Um, I have done events. I will continue to do gatherings and events once we are all able to safely gather. But I want to have that flexibility to be creative and pivot to whatever the current time calls for. Um, so going axe throwing to 
let go of all our sins before Yom Kippur is an event that I held last year with some people. And um, yeah, I, I, don't, I just don't feel the need to offer everything to everyone. I am very comfortable knowing that I have a specific gift and niche to offer. And that's what people come to me for. Um, and I'm honest with them when we first meet and whatever they're looking for, I'll say, hey, I will give you whatever resources, whatever community, however you want to tap into Judaism. I'm happy to be that guide for you. Um, but here's what I do and here's what I don't do. Mm, mm-hmm. That's really great. <laughs> hey, Zeke. <laughs> What's going on over there? <laughs> a headphone would help me. <laughs> it's, cool. it's so okay. I love it. <laughs> Earlier on, before we started recording, you were telling me about the kinds of people who are coming to you for engagement and the kinds of backgrounds that they're bringing and the levels of education and deep thinking that they're already engaged with in other areas of their life. And then um, I just would love for you to explain like how you present Judaism to them, like how you bring it to them in a way that appeals and engages them in the right ways. Sure. Um, So, so I'm based here in Philadelphia um, and I really started with meeting a lot of people as they were preparing for their wedding. So, um, unlike I think how it used to happen, um, people no longer are calling synagogues to necessarily look for a rabbi to officiate their wedding. They're looking online at wedding websites and, um, and then they, you know, find someone they feel connected with. They feel like, they often feel like I'm similar to them in other aspects. And, um, and then when we meet, you know, they are just, they're really professionals in their own right. So they're physicians or PhDs or lawyers, or, um, they're just extremely educated in their own regard. And I feel like I cannot say to people who have their own background and education, like, here's how you light Hanukkah candles, or here's how you light Shabbat candles without giving them the reasons why, or the background, or, um, you know, maybe some philosophers who feel like this is why it's important to take time in your life. Um, Abraham Joshua Heschel is someone I turn to frequently as um, just a relatable modern philosopher. Um, And yeah, and, you know, just trying to take whatever is present for them, whether it be a a musical artist or um, people will say to me, Oh, you know, we always love to do um, like to just take a neighborhood walk on the weekend. And I'll say, that's amazing. Here's a way to add some intention to that. Like just figuring out what makes their own value into thinking about with a Jewish lens is what um, is is really just what I'm striving to help people do to think of it as Judaism because in so many ways it is we just don't put it in that category for ourselves. Right, right, and I think what you're talking about is so common. Like again, before we started recording, you referred to it as pediatric Judaism, yes. and and I'll let you expand on it because I I think that 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 gap that you've identified is so true um, in in millennial Jews that are like my age. So mm-hmm. I'm going to let you explain and then maybe I'll jump in again in a minute. Okay. So, um, so what is pediatric Judaism? So there's this phenomenon of um, parents sending their 
children to religious school um, up until the name Metzvah. So up until they're about 13 and then that's it. <laughs> they drop out. They come back maybe to Hillel in college. Um, and then they go to get married <laughs> sometimes. Um, and they say, okay, I know nothing about Judaism <laughs> because they might know as much about Judaism um, as whatever they can remember and whatever is cultural Judaism to them. So what they celebrate in their homes with their families. Um, but they probably don't know anything about Judaism that you would learn as an adult because what you might learn before 13 is so different than what you learn as an adult learner. Um, so it, you know, for lack of a better word, it, it's kind of like almost it's dumbed down a little bit. Like here's the how to in a step-by-step -step guide. Um, but no one goes into the why or how we got there or where the tradition comes from. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to fill in that gap for people. Um, and a lot of times the reason I'm doing that is because they themselves are trying to understand it. So that's one piece. And I work a lot with, um, I hate this term, but interfaith couples or uh, multi-faith, multi-religious, um, or where one partner just is not um, pra practicing any religion, um, a lot of cultural Jews as well. And um, and they don't know how to describe what they do in their families to their partners. Um, so we sort of learn together and try and fill in whatever would be meaningful in their lives, whatever um, makes sense and is a good thing to incorporate. But what I don't want people to do is to, to say like, oh, well, Judaism only has to offer these really basic things because it's such a rich religion and um, there's so much more that gets taught. And yeah, I think in, in liberal Judaism, at least where um, people might have grown up reform or um, conservative reconstructionist where you're not necessarily doing every single piece of Jewish law in your own home and life, a lot of things just get left out um, and the understanding behind it gets left out. So yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, it totally does. Um, I'm going to jump back just like a small moment to ask you, why, why do you hate the word interfaith couple? Oh, because I think it's just so much more nuanced. Interfaith implies that it's two people of two of two different faith practicing. Um, you know, they're practicing two religions, and oftentimes that's not the case. It's it just doesn't incorporate enough people. Whereas, like multi faith, multi um, religious. Uh, multiracial um I, I don't know it just uh, oftentimes people don't feel they are defined by interfaith whatever their own relationship might be for because sure that yeah. word just comes up all the time so I was right. very curious so it does imply two um faiths who are both trying to practice their religion and oftentimes I meet people where one person has a religion that they are interested in practicing and the other is either um, atheists or, um, or just non-practicing. Um, there's a lot. So I work also with an organization called 18 Doors and they've also unpacked this for a long time as well. Can you tell us more about the work that you do with 18 Doors and, and what they do as an organization? Sure. Um, so 18 Doors works with um, families, so both couples and um, families in any regard that are, um, that are primarily 
although not exclusively, um, where one person in the family is Jewish. Um, so they try and help provide resources and how to navigate, how to celebrate um, holidays or life cycle with um, with your family and, and how to help people create traditions in their own home, um, even if that doesn't look like the traditions you grew up with. So they do work with multi-faith um, families, again, where there is an aspect of Judaism. It's not two faiths where no one is Jewish. That <laughs> wouldn't make sense <laughs> for their organization. But they, they call it Unlocking Jewish. They um, just went, and they're previously called Interfaith Family. Um, so I work with them as a Rukin Rabbinic Fellow. And for me, it was such a natural fit because it was already what I was doing and what my own mission was. Um, so I am so honored and happy to be able to help serve their community as well. Um, and they really give, they, they're doing a, a fellowship at the moment, and then they're going to keep expanding that fellowship. And they give rabbis the resources to do this work better. Um, so I was lucky enough to start with them in 2018 and, um, we'll continue to do that. So cool. Yeah. Um, I'd love to jump back to tackling Torah, not to discuss necessarily exactly the things that you're, um, providing, although certainly we can continue to talk about that, but I would love to hear from your perspective as an entrepreneur about the process of starting an organization. Um, as far as I can tell, you're doing this, like, largely solo, although correct. please correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, solo. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, how do you go about starting this? Like, how do you manage providing all of these incredible not only life cycle services, but also classes. Um, I have been dreaming and thinking about this for a long time. Um, I have always felt like millennial Jews, those and those who love them have really been my quote unquote target audience. They're sort of like, people that I feel um, aligned with because it's my own community. But um, I just had so many conversations with my peers and just felt like people didn't know where to turn to find a rabbi. <laughs> um, and that was really disheartening to me. So as I went through rabbinical school and um, continued to dream up how to serve the Jewish community at large. Um, I felt like that was somewhere that I could really make a difference. And um, I wanted people to have access to amazing ritual. Not just like, okay, I could find someone that will show up at my life cycle event, even though I'm unaffiliated with a synagogue, but like someone that will show up and do an amazing job at their life cycle event. So much so that they then want to continue being involved and learn more. Um, so, it, yeah, it just was, I didn't know how else not to do something like this. Um, but I'll tell you, it's not easy to be an entrepreneur in so many ways. Um, I am constantly thinking of new projects that I just don't have the capacity as one human to do. Um, until I get to the point where I can hire someone. And there are plenty of things where I don't know how to use the technology. So I have to figure out how to outsource pieces. Um, and I've invested so much of my own time and, and money too, to be able to be at the point where I started my own nonprofit. So Tackling Tour is actually a nonprofit. Um, other entrepreneurs will do a for-profit 
um, limited liability corporation, but mine is a Jewish education nonprofit. And throughout all of these transitions that we've all been going through over the past few months, especially since COVID hit, I'm sure that you've also had to navigate some some pivots. What has that looked like? Um, so the piece about COVID <laughs> that is most fascinating to my own family is that my husband is actually an emergency room physician. Um, so when COVID started, as much as I wish that I could have jumped in and been able to pastorally support people and just be there for the emotions and the spiritual journey that people needed to be on, um, as a (laughs) essential worker household, um, I had to take the role of just being parent, um, at the time, we had a three-month-old oh uh, and a and a newly turned four-year-old. So, um, so in many many ways, whatever I would have liked to do was not able to be done as quickly as I possibly could. Um, I did lots of things that I am certainly very proud of. Um, I was able to just reach out to people at the beginning and see what assistance they might need. Um, I was supposed to be leading weddings from um, mid-March through the fall, almost every weekend. And Mm -hmm. a lot of those weddings have, um, have changed what their plans look like. Um, as well as B'nai Metzvahs. I have a lot of B'nai Metzvah families as well. And, um, you know, I, I think that for me, it's just been an amazing gratitude practice. It's been taking that step back and saying, there were so many things that everyone was looking forward to. And maybe we just didn't have the chance to even realize that our communities were already hurting in so many ways. And um, I've just found the ability to both be there for my kids, to really teach them how to care for their community and for others. Um, We started our own vegetable garden, which we take care of, and we bring the food to neighbors. And we, um, you know, write people cards that we put in the mail, Um, things that I haven't done in a very long time um, where I'm teaching my kids how to be there for others and care for the people around them. And I think that that is in itself just, just amazing work as well. We've shown up at protests um, for Black Lives Matter. We've, we've been able to just, make sure that people's voice are heard. Um, we brought people gifts before Shabbat. Um, yeah, I, I just think that all of that is good work too. Yeah. Like you said earlier, they're, they're your little congregation now. <laughs> yes. I, I think that Torah is living and breathing Jewish values. And if you can do that with one person, you're, it's as if you saved the world is also a, a Jewish teaching and statement. So um, being able to bring these guys along for the ride, whatever that might look like, has been helpful to me um, when I know that I can't be there as I would like to be as a rabbi. Not that I'm not doing great things, but I always wish I could be doing more. Yeah, I think that that's a feeling that Many people who listen to this podcast definitely relate to. Um, So before I let you go for today, I would love to know two more things from you. Um, The first one is, is there anything else that you wish that I would have asked you or anything else that's really inspiring you lately? Um, You know... So I, 
I'm actually very inspired by the people that I work with all the time, um, especially right now, because there are so many ways in which people could have said they were looking forward to their this moment in their lives, some for B'nai Mitzvahs, and you know, I have families who have an only child, and they've been looking forward to this B'nai Mitzvah in their life for years already, and then the year that it's going to happen there's this huge upset in the world. Um, And there are people who have been waiting for their wedding for three years. You know, they've been engaged and working towards this. Um, But not once did anyone I'm working with get upset or frustrated by this, at least um, in our conversations. They all just felt like, wow, this is a chance to look at the fact that we have each other and how amazing it is that um, that we found love or that we have this kid that can accomplish all these great things. And, um, and I'm just so in awe by people saying, you know what, there's a time for celebration and we will get there and we will celebrate and we do want our whole community to be a part of that. And yet we also want to take care of all the people who are hurting right now. And um, and if that's not us, we're grateful and happy to help. And if that is us, like this is what we need. Mm. Um, so it's just, I don't feel like I've ever checked in with my neighbors as much as I have in this current time. And I, um, and people's patience has just been so surprising and amazing to me. You know, when I've said to people, Hey, I'd love to get back to you, but I have two little kids at home. Um, they've just been extremely, um, forgiving and understanding. And, and that has helped me know that, that I'm in this for the long haul, that like becoming an entrepreneur was the right decision for me. And, Um, and that I'm just excited to do the work in the future. Yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. My last question for you, it's kind of similar, um, but just what is one thing that's making you really happy? One thing making me really happy. Um, Um, well, I'm someone who really loves the fall. I really love the high holidays and um, just getting out there and taking a walk in cooler weather. Um, so we actually just went as a family at the end of the summer. We went um, to the beach on Plum Island, Massachusetts for wow. a week. Um, and I think we we all just really needed to see the ocean (laughs) Um, and to really just watch my kids play and our dog just run around the beach. And um, so just getting outside a lot has been helpful. Um, And I'm looking forward to celebrating the high holidays with my own family. Um, I haven't always had the opportunity to do that. Sometimes I do both. Sometimes I host family and I'm working. Um, And this year I'll be able to just enjoy having um, my family around. And and in the time of coronavirus and Judaism, I'll be able to tap into all of my colleagues' wonderful services all around the, all around the United States, which is really cool. Um, the, the Jewish community has pivoted to be able to offer these, uh, these services through <laughs> through the internet um, so that anyone that wants to access it can. And I hope that that will bring people um, a feeling of just being further connected. So, hoping to hear some really great Torah this high holiday season. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, Shana Tova, and um, just thank you again for for sharing of yourself and for bringing Zeke along. Hey, Zeke.
Thank you. Shana Tova. It's always ah! <laughs> Zeke. Zeke, you learning how to say Shana Tova? Um, it's just always so great to connect with people and to learn about the work that other Jews are doing in the world. So I'm very honored to be able to be here and share what I do and learn a little bit about Jews. <laughs> Can I do it again? I'm, I'm happy to learn about Jufo. Thank you. you. Take care. Leader Folk is all about elevating voices and starting conversations. So now we'd love to hear from you. Email us at podcast at tcjewfolk.com to share your thoughts, your ideas, or to nominate future guests. Leader Folk is a project of Jew Folk Inc. and the Jew Folk Podcast Network. For more information, visit tcjewfolk.com slash podcast. <laughs>